the wheels of drama never stop turning. Okay, maybe not. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be counting down our picks for another top 10 video game controversies. Winning big, money, 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 exclamation, exclamation, woo woo, kids, come on, anyone can play of any age. For this list, we take a look at events or incidents in the industry that generated a significant amount of discussion, opinion, and of course, outrage. And not broader, ongoing cultural debates like representation, corporate meddling, ethics, etc, etc. <laughs> Number 10, Bully. You seem to have an aptitude for senseless destruction, Jimmy. Despite evidence linking games and real-life violence being contradictory at best, controversy is never far behind any Rockstar release, as politicians and other activists often raise their concerns. There's a real simple solution here. That is, show me the game. Give me Adam. the game and I'll play it and I'll, I'll let them know whether or not I or anybody else has a problem with it. Glorification of bullying was the target this time, as one man labeled the school-based title a Columbine simulator. Calls for mans were widespread, with one even being put into effect in Brazil. Yet, regular gamers were content to wait until it was actually released before adding their voices. And every bullying expert who's aware of this game has predicted that this game will lead to real-world violence in schools. The final product certainly contains fighting, don't get us wrong. Yet, in-game it's only legitimized when you're standing up to a bully, with any other serial misbehavior strictly being punished. Many still couldn't be satisfied, however, and many players accused them of remaining intentionally blind to the game's considerable creative achievements. You could do a little public service, it'll do you good. Go mow the lawn. Isn't there a law against slave labor? Number nine, digital homicide versus Jim Sterling and Steam users. Seem to think you didn't put any effort in yourselves. For example, the blood spatter that shows damage on the game. That seems to have been ripped from Google Images to the point where uh, all of the artifacts from the, uh, I'm assuming you use PNG images, uh, are still visible. This debacle began in 2014, when YouTube personality Jim Sterling released a scathing review of Digital Homicide's FPS, The Slaughtering Grounds, which is, by the way, a standard procedure for many YouTube personalities. This isn't in early access, by the way. This is a, a finished product, just thought I'd point that out. Instead of taking his criticism in stride, the company abusively fired back before filing a $15 million lawsuit against Sterling for slander. And of course, this opened the floodgates for backlash from Steam reviewers. So what does Digital Homicide do in response to that? They file another lawsuit against 100 anonymous users while also requesting a subpoena to reveal their personal information. The latest lawsuit filed by Digital Homicide co-founders, the Romine brothers, is a personal injury lawsuit titled Romine vs. Unknown Party. <laughs> That's the internet. The internet is the, the unknown, unknown party. party. This, in turn, led to Steam removing all of Digital Homicide's games from their online store. And now, without any means of income, the company had to drop the latter case. I bet you guys are really regretting digging that hole any deeper, eh? I'm not your everyday moron. I'm Jim f***ing Sterling. That's my name now. That's my new name. Number 8. Paying for user-created mods. Extra Apple mod for a reasonable $29.99. That's right, now you can have an apple on a table. It might have been resolved about as quickly as it blew up. But for four tumultuous days, gamers were sure upset. Mod creators that choose to charge for their mods are only receiving 25% of the earnings, and the rest are going to Valve and Bethesda. Put into force by Valve and Bethesda, the concept in its rawest form would afford creators the freedom to make a living out of something they previously had to rely on donations to support. Gamers were also pissed off because they saw it as an assault on the tradition of free mods. However, the idea was flawed upon launch and soon got torn apart by irate Skyrim players. Copyright and pricing issues ran rampant, while many felt that 25-75% to revenue split between the developer would allow them to release subpar games reliant on cheap mod fixes. Valve first launched those last spring, killed them within just a few days after the community Fusro died the whole project. The move was widely panned, resulting in Skyrim being bombed with negative reviews. It also, probably most importantly, spat in the face of the essence of modding culture. But at least Valve weren't too stubborn to ignore player feedback, and they reversed their decision. Valve and Bethesda decided, you know what, we're gonna cancel that whole paid mod thing and, you know, on Skyrim and just pretend like it kind of never happened. Number seven, Xbox One's pre-launch DRM policies. And I've never been more excited than I am today. There may be a time when always online and all digital features are the norm. And in that sense, Microsoft were ahead of their time. However, the new features that were being touted seemed far too drastic for the average consumer. People who aren't able to get some form of connectivity is called Xbox 360. 
Microsoft's new policy required that their new console always needed to be online, while at the same time providing a convoluted system for how to share games with friends or sell them once you used them. Sony capitalized on this outrage at their E3 presentation in spectacular fashion, winning over most of the gaming community and forcing Microsoft to backtrack on these limitations. But the damage was done, and the predicted console war became a console massacre. In addition, PlayStation 4 disc-based games don't need to be connected online to play. Number 6. Nintendo Creators Program Nintendo claiming of ad revenue will only drive content creators away rather than embrace the free publicity those videos provide. Nintendo and the YouTube community haven't got along ever since the legendary company removed monetized videos featuring their intellectual property, some saying that they abused YouTube's notoriously exploitable copyright system in the process. As far as I can tell, there's no distinction between whether you're a critic or an entertainer or a reviewer, whatever you call yourself. Nintendo wants you to shake hands and make compromises on your coverage if you're uploading game footage to YouTube. That relationship deteriorated even further upon the announcement of Nintendo's own scheme, allowing creators to use whitelisted games as long as they, get this, gave them 40% of the revenue. Everybody but Nintendo wants the content creator to keep the lion's share. Compared to other development companies who embraced the free exposure that huge YouTube personalities give their games, Nintendo showed that they really wanted a slice of that pie while maintaining sway to monitor what was said about their assets. Unless your review is just you standing in front of a camera with zero footage of the game, you must obey Nintendo's rules. Nintendo argued that this was to protect their brand, but many YouTube personalities, including PewDiePie, have stated that they just won't showcase Nintendo's games anymore. Bummer. Do you think they're going to come after us for our drunk Mario party? We no, we're not on their radar. We man. haven't done that yet. Oh, okay, well, but I mean, we might. And it, was, it was Mario Kart and it was Smash Brothers. So we'll, oh, the, but we were drunk, so you don't remember. Or, is it 40%? Number 5. Middle Earth. Shadow of Mordor Branded Deal. PewDiePie and other YouTubers took money from Warner Brothers for positive game reviews. Now that's f***ed up. YouTube personalities can engage with their audience in a fashion that the usual gaming press can never achieve. The personal nature of their content makes them ideal vehicles for promoting certain products. There was a concerted effort to not give out a code unless you could abide by terms that would control your content in a number of overbearing ways. It's a great form of marketing in theory, but it becomes problematic when what they say is contractually controlled and the figure in question doesn't disclose that their content is being sponsored. So my apologies. I will not be able to tell you about the branding system, but I can tell you about everything else. Terms from a marketing firm representing Shadow of Middle-Earth, Played Social, contained such limitations, asserting that no bugs could be shown and that viewers must be positively encouraged to make a purchase. I think even in the world of professional video game journalism, there is some amount of punishment for being, you know, giving a negative review to something. Several YouTubers who accepted the offer said that such stipulations were negotiable, but others denounced it as a shady method of manipulating public impressions by exploiting the platform's independent perception. The irony of all this was that Shadow of Mordor really kicked ass and didn't need this kind of marketing to begin with, although the backlash would have definitely been worse if it had turned out to be hot garbage. Videos must include discussion of the Nemesis system. This really should take up the bulk of the focus, such as how different the orcs are, how vivid their personalities and dialogue are. Number four, No Man's Sky marketing and release. The Advertising Standards Authority in England is exploring whether this game is responsible for false advertising. This space-based survival title was one of the most hyped games ever for one reason, Sean Murray and his extravagant promises. A little bit like Journey or Dark Souls, we want players to have a sense that there are other people playing the game at the same time. Whether his claims constitute a deliberate attempt to mislead consumers or was simply reckless optimism from a small, inexperienced developer is incredibly difficult to ascertain. Part of the problem is Hello Games' relative silence in response to players' complaints about missing features and numerous glitches, allowing those same commenters to dominate the conversation, thereby forming a complete narrative without one side of the story. Murray wrote in a series of tweets that No Man's Sky is not a multiplayer game. Please don't go in looking for that experience. Until the company speaks up, any words defending them are purely speculative. We can only hope that the absence of discussion means that they're working on delivering the game that players had envisioned before it's too late. No Man's Sky captured our imaginations, and in our mind's eye, we all envisioned what the experience was going to be like before we had it. And sometimes, as the old saying goes, you want to sort of shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Number three, CSGO Lotto. It Apparently, these two have been allegedly faking gambling and also faking winning huge amounts of cash. First exposed by a YouTuber named Honor the Call, YouTube personalities T. Martin and Pro Syndicate 
are alleged to have hidden their ownership of a skin gambling site while promoting it to their partly underage audience, potentially having the power to rig the betting videos that they made. T. Martin Enterprises wins something from CSGO Lotto and Trevor pays himself. It's that simple. Instead of remaining tight-lipped, T. Martin somewhat insincerely apologized, stating his ownership of the company was on public record, but this really only served to worsen public opinion towards them. FTC regulations require clear disclosure in order to avoid deceptive advertising, although as another video from H3H3 Productions showed, that was definitely not always the case. And we found this new site called CSGO Lotto, so I'll link it down in the description if you guys want to check it out. But we were betting on it today and I won a pot of like $69 or something like that, so it's a pretty small pot, but it was like the coolest feeling ever. Number two, Jeff Gerstmann gets fired. Some really neat ideas are buried deep, deep in there, but you're gonna have to do a whole lot of digging, more than you'll probably want to do. You may not know the messy details, but you've no doubt heard about this tale that is synonymous with the questionable ethics that many feel pervade gaming journalism. Ain't and Lynch dead men. Yeah. Um, which, uh, heck of a game. <laughs> After Gertzman's non-disclosure agreement ended in 2012, we finally got a satisfying conclusion to the five-year-old rumors. Following Gertzman's mediocre reviews of games like Kane and Lynch Dead Men, unhappy publishers such as Eidos and Sony threatened to withdraw funds they paid to promote on GameSpot. That is, that is when I was uh, called into a room and, and let go, was, yeah. uh, was uh, shortly after Thanksgiving in 07. Under this pressure, the site's inexperienced advertising team crumpled and showed Gerstmann the door. Despite many still writing such situations off as a tolerated reality in the field, the majority supported the long-serving journalist for retaining his sincerity even as others criticized him for his divisive views. Yeah. That game was not a fantastic game. Nope. Um, so I s said as much, um, and uh, a lot of this stuff kind of came up again. Before we reveal our top pick, let's take a look at some honorable mentions. Alina, Christy, Lee, Alyssa, Lars, Jack X, Brian, Mega Man, and fucking Pac Man. He's asking if they can drink water out of empty Mountain Dew cans. No drinks are allowed on the stage except for Mountain Dew or water. Co and he, coffee wasn't even allowed. No, no, people were drinking coffee in the corners. Number one, Konami versus Kojima. Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony. As one of video game development's true visionary icons, Konami couldn't have picked a worse person to allegedly treat poorly, particularly as they moved to the unpopular mobile first orientation. Speculation about Kojima's position in the company began when his name was taken off of the Phantom Pain branding in March 2015, and in the months after, fans pieced together vague information pointing towards his imminent departure from the company. Sources from within the studio revealed that Hideo Kojima, who has spearheaded the Metal Gear franchise at Konami for nearly 30 years, is expected to leave Kojima Productions in December following the release of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Kojima's three-decade tenure at the company was officially ended in December of that year, with rumors indicating that Konami had grown tired of his lavish development budgets. Although there's still shade being thrown by both sides, Konami banned him from attending the Game Awards, so Kojima drank their tears, somewhat literally. It seems that the split was the best for everyone involved. So we want, want you to know, Hideo, that we're thinking of you. And, um... We miss you. We hope to see you at the Game Awards 2016. Do you agree with our list? Which gaming controversies did you follow closely? If you didn't see a topic you thought should be on here, be sure to check out our first list on the top 10 video game controversies. And for more not-so-controversial top 10s published every day, be sure to subscribe to WatchMojo.com. Yes, a little rough around the edges, but you're a diamond, boy. A diamond. Thank you, sir.